Walking to his next class, Art couldn't shake off a tinge of frustration. His impatience during the demonstration against Professor Geist had been evident. He had wanted to overpower the professor as swiftly as possible. However, his reliance on only wind and earth attributes had hindered him from achieving the swift victory he had aimed for. His abundance of talents had potentially inflated his confidence more than it should have. The truth was, his journey towards mastering his strength in this world was far from complete. Despite having distinct advantages that could propel him to the zenith of power, he still had much room for growth. It was time to shift his focus from comparing himself to peers of his age and instead set his sights on broader horizons. He hoped that the advanced classes would offer insights into mana manipulation that he couldn't attain solely on his own. The anticipation for the next class, Basics of Artificing, had Art's curiosity peaked. He was certain that while there might be similarities with the technology of his previous world, the concept of artificing, manipulating and coding mana to imbue objects with specific functions, would be an entirely novel experience for him. Stepping into the classroom, he found the setup resembling a laboratory filled with beakers, containers, assorted ores, and an array of intricate gadgets. As students filled the seats, reconnecting with friends and acquaintances, a girl of his age approached him and stood beside the vacant stool next to his. She seemed rather anxious, prompting Art to offer a friendly smile. Is this seat taken? If it is, I can find another one. Her panicked demeanor was a bit puzzling, but he tried to put her at ease. No, it's not taken. Feel free to sit there if you'd like, Art replied, settling into his own seat. The girl sported a pair of thick, round glasses that magnified her eyes, emphasizing the freckles beneath them. Her curly hair, forcefully tied into a ponytail cascading down her back, seemed to have a life of its own. Thank you, she murmured, her head bowed slightly. She mumbled something more, but her words remained elusive to Art's ears. What was that? He leaned in closer, intrigued to catch her words. Emily, my name is Emily Watskin. Please be my friend. I mean, pleased to meet you. Her eyes widened, clearly surprised by her own abrupt statement. Caught off guard for a moment, Art couldn't help but burst into laughter. There was something endearing about her that made him feel at ease almost instantly. Of course, I'm Arthur Lewin, he introduced himself, extending his hand. Emily's palm felt surprisingly calloused against his. Oh, I'm sorry, it probably feels gross, right? She hastily pulled her hand back, her cheeks flushing a deeper shade of red, which only accentuated her freckles. No, not at all. I have calluses too. Look. Art held out his sword hand, revealing the hardened lumps on his palms to her. Wow, you must practice a lot. It's no wonder you're on the disciplinary committee. I really admire that. For me, I really love artificing, so I end up fiddling around with a lot of gadgets. Unfortunately, it makes my hands rough, she shared, her gaze fixed on her palms. Really? I admire people like you. I'm jealous that you have such a passion for artificing. With fighting, the only things you get better at are destroying and killing, but the better you get at artificing, the more things you can create, Art responded, his eyes drifting down to his own calloused hands. Whoa, that's deep. Emily adjusted her thick glasses as she contemplated his words. I ended up saying something unpleasant, I apologize. The classroom was filling up with the chatter of eager students, most of whom were scholar mages. No, no, it wasn't unpleasant at all, she reassured, her hands gesturing placatingly. Just it's not something you hear every day from a 12-year-old. You say that as if you aren't a 12-year-old yourself, Art remarked with a chuckle. Slumping in her chair, Emily let out a sigh. True. It's because I'm apparently a genius of some sort. I don't really get why people say that, but everyone treats me differently ever since I created the projection display artifact. Art leapt up from his stool in astonishment. Wait, what? You're the one who invented the display used to show the king's and queen's announcement? Mm-hmm. Well, only a part of it. I tinkered around with some things in my parents' lab and made the basic designs a couple years back. She twisted a strand of her curly hair around her finger. He sank back onto his seat, stunned. Holy crap. She'd built something like that before she was even ten. He let out a whistle. Well, I must say it's an honor to be in the presence of a genius such as yourself. Oh, please. Don't you start, too. Besides, you're quite famous yourself, you know. Her glasses reflected the classroom light as she grinned at him, giving her the appearance of an evil scientist. 
Really? I've tried very hard to lay low. I guess that didn't work. Art leaned his head on his hand. Well, joining the disciplinary committee as a first year sure didn't help, Emily commented. Art retorted, there are other first year students on the committee as well, but not humans. You and Princess Kathleen are the only ones, and the princess has been hailed as a prodigy since she awakened. That leaves you, a mysterious human freshman who has no background, some weird fox-looking mana beast, and the ability to overwhelm and completely demolish a professor who's a veteran adventurer at the light yellow core stage. She leaned closer and closer to him as she spoke. What? How do you already know about what happened with Professor Geist? That literally happened 15 minutes ago. Q? Sylvie echoed, tilting her head at the word weird. Don't be so surprised. This is a magic academy after all. News travels fast and gossip travels even faster. I bet you half the people in this class already know what happened. She grinned and wagged her finger. Oh God, you know you're awfully talkative now compared to how you introduced yourself when you first came in. Art remarked, noticing the dramatic change in Emily's personality. I suck with strangers, okay? I don't usually get along with new people this easily. You're different, though. I feel really comfortable with you. She glanced at him, still wearing that broad grin, and added, Maybe it's because we're both freaks. Art rolled his eyes, but he couldn't deny the truth in her words. Her intelligence made him more comfortable around her than other kids his age. He was about to reply when the classroom door swung open, revealing a familiar face. Greetings, plebeians. Please feel honored to have me, Professor Gideon, as your teacher for this class. The eccentric scientist energetically made his way down to the podium, a pair of goggles bouncing up and down around his neck. He surveyed the classroom with a condescending eye, eventually fixing his gaze on Emily and Art. Ah, well, if it isn't Arthur, I had no idea you would be in my class, Professor Gideon exclaimed clapping his cheeks in a dramatic pretense of surprise. Art shook his head at the professor's antics, and my oh my, getting along with Miss Watskin. I must say, you two would make quite the team. Good, good. Let's begin the first day of classes with a little introduction of myself. He grinned as he wrote his name in big letters behind him. The lecture continued, with Gideon rambling on about how remarkable he was for the next hour and a half. Most students, Art included, were half asleep. Sylvie was curled up on the desk in front of him, using his arm as a pillow. But Emily's eyes sparkled as she absorbed every bit of information that passed Gideon's thin lips. Gideon was obviously well-respected in the field of artificing, even by a genius like her. It almost made him want to admire him. Almost. Suddenly, an olive-green owl flew in through the window and landed on Art's shoulder. Q! Sylvie jumped up in surprise and growled, but the owl just groomed itself calmly. It seems Director Goodsky is beckoning you, Gideon said as he walked up to Art, rolling his shoulders to get the kinks out. You shouldn't keep her waiting. Shoo, off you go. Gideon slapped Art's back and went back to talking about how great he was. Emily leaned in, not surprised. I told you news travels fast. Yeah, yeah. As Art walked out of the classroom, he could hear some of his classmates begin to discuss what had happened. Now, where was Director Cynthia's office again? He scratched his head. As if he understood, the owl took off from Art's shoulder and flew slowly toward the right, gesturing for them to follow with a flick of his head. Q, Sylvie warned, her fur standing on end. Papa, he's dangerous! The campus was nearly empty. Most students were either in class, training on their own, or in their dorms. Distracted by the beautiful scenery of the campus, Art was slow to realize that the owl had landed on a statue in front of a building, the director's office, he assumed and was waiting for him to enter. He opened the door and headed inside. The horned owl perched itself on his shoulder again, making Sylvie hiss and throw paws at it in warning. I see Avier has personally guided you here. Odd, I have never seen him get so comfortable with a stranger. Professor Goodsky was sitting behind her desk. She looked at Art intently for several moments. Then she studied Sylvie in particular. Was there something you needed from me, Director? Art took a seat in front of her desk, and Avier, the green owl, left his shoulder to perch on the window ledge behind Cynthia. Yes, I called you here regarding the demonstration in Professor Geis' class. Her expression remained unfazed as she mentioned the trouble he must have caused her. Ah, uh, there were some situations beforehand regarding that, actually. But before Art could explain, 
Director Goodsky lifted up her hand to interrupt. We've just dismissed Professor Geist from the Academy. Princess Kathleen came forward and explained to me exactly what happened. Of course, I had to verify her testimony, but everyone I spoke to agreed that the professor was a danger to students. She nodded, placing a couple of documents in front of him. Wow. She worked fast. The incident had taken place less than two hours ago, but she had already managed to investigate it and fire the professor. As if she knew what he was thinking, she smiled and added, Things move quickly when the director has the final say in all matters regarding this academy. I have to say, though, I have never seen the princess as worked up as she was today. When she came in, she looked slightly angry, which by her standards is quite serious. You can imagine how surprised I was. Director Goodsky covered her mouth with a hand as she chuckled softly. Really? I didn't think the princess could even show emotion, Art grinned as well. You must have made quite an impression on her, because she argued for you quite fervently, leaving Professor Geist no room to defend himself. When Art shook his head helplessly, Director Goodsky just laughed and said, You're quite the ladies' man, Arthur. It's going to be a problem if you steal the hearts of both princesses. Who knows? You might be the cause of our next civil war. She seemed quite amused by something that could devastate the precarious balance of this continent. He wanted to just dismiss the thought, but when he imagined the two princesses fighting it out, he shuddered. He didn't have the mental capacity to handle even one princess, let alone both of them. Well, I won't pry too deeply, but the age of marriage isn't as far away as you think, she said lightly. No, thank you. I don't see myself becoming romantically involved anytime soon. Besides, they're still just kids. Maybe I'll start thinking about it when the girls my age are a bit more mature. He shrugged. Leaning forward, the director studied Art. Hmm. You say that as if you've already matured, Arthur. Well, you must admit I do happen to be much more mature than most people my age, he responded, settling back into the chair. True, but women tend to mature faster than men. Director Goodsky stated matter-of-factly. I'm still wondering why you called me in here. I'm sure you didn't bring me in just to tell me everything was settled and I should get married. Sylvie hopped off his head and approached Avier, who was grooming himself in the window. Arthur, I feel like you're beginning to see me as someone who always has an ulterior motive at hand. She gave him a mock-offended look. Well, I do, because we're awfully similar in that way, Director, Art said with a smile. Dear me, if that is the case, then I believe I've made the right decision, she responded. What do you mean? Arthur, I'd like you to act as a visiting professor for your practical mana manipulation class. She pushed a document toward him, studying him carefully. At least until we can find another instructor to fill the position. His eyes widened. You're not serious, right? Oh, I'm quite serious, Arthur, she said, her expression unfaltering. Is that even allowed? I'm a student, not even finished with my first day of school. My first school. Can I be a student and a professor at the same time? What about my other classes? He began shooting out arguments as to why this wouldn't work. Please, no need to get so worked up. It's quite simple, actually. Is it allowed? Yes, as long as I say it is. Although this specific situation has never occurred, there have been cases of highly qualified upperclassmen teaching basic courses. As for your other classes, your schedule wouldn't really change. You would just be teaching that one class for that period. She gave him a business-like smile. He began thinking. Director Goodsky wasn't doing this for her benefit. She would be sure to get a lot of complaints from noble parents protesting the fact that a first year was teaching a class. He, on the other hand, would have a bit more work, assuming he actually prepared lessons instead of just winging it. But at least he wouldn't have homework. I don't understand why you're doing this, Director. Well... A spot just opened up and you were the one who defeated the previous professor. Isn't that enough of a qualification? I'm really not doing this for some ulterior motive, Arthur. You don't have to be too suspicious. This is up to you. I won't push you into this, but I believe it would be a good opportunity to build your reputation without having to go around conquering professors. It would put you in the spotlight to some extent, but I'd be well placed to defend you if necessary. Parents are bound to complain. They'll say, they may complain, she said, cutting him off, but I am the director, and it's a better solution than canceling the entire class. She paused for a moment, thinking. 
I've heard your concerns, but I am willing to support my decision. You are unnaturally talented, and it has already been mentioned that you are unusually mature for your age. I'm confident you'll be an excellent teacher. Perhaps there may even be room for you to take on more teaching opportunities in the future, should you find it to your liking. It would be a better use of your time than sitting through classes you're clearly overqualified for, wouldn't it? Good Sky stood and laid a gentle hand on his shoulder. The choice is yours. Art sat there, staring off blankly into the distance and pondering what the director had said. As she'd mentioned, there was no real benefit for her to hire him as a professor, which was why he found it so suspicious. It was deeply ingrained in him to be wary of other people's motivations, no matter who they were. As a figure of authority and power, he had naturally learned to be suspicious of everyone around him, and he couldn't fathom why she'd asked him to do this. Practical amount of manipulation didn't seem like a class that would give out work to grade, so it would be easy for him to teach the class. Even if it wasn't easier than just taking the class, it would help him earn a name for himself and would be a lot more interesting. Seeing as how he probably couldn't escape the attention of the other students anyway, he might as well do things a bit differently. Of course, he didn't plan to reveal his full set of skills to anyone just yet, but he didn't see the point in trying to be completely inconspicuous anymore, especially after today. Art snapped out of his thoughts to see director Goodsky looking at him expectantly. Ah, uh, yes. Although I'm not sure how competent I'll be in the role, I'd like to try my hand at being a teacher, he said, turning his attention to the document outlining his duties and responsibilities as a professor. I'm sure you'll do an excellent job, she smiled. Looking up, he asked, Did Professor Geist teach any other classes besides mine? Fortunately, no. We hired him this year after he retired as an adventurer. The other professors and I decided to have him teach only one class this semester as a sort of test run, she explained, shaking her head at the pitiful outcome. Before I sign, I have one question, he said as he read over the final paragraph of the document. Go on, she urged. It says I'm not allowed to hurt the students. Will that be a conflict, since I'm part of the disciplinary committee? Ah, good question. The no hurting students rule is for inside the classroom. Any incident is always investigated, and force is permitted as long as your actions are taken for the safety of other students, such as using an appropriate degree of force to quell a fight or restrain a student who's out of control. As for outside of class, in the course of your disciplinary committee duties, I'll trust your judgment on that. He nodded and signed the document. I expect great things from you, Arthur, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, she said, giving him a gentle pat on the shoulder before ushering him out to go eat lunch. Cynthia Goodsky pondered, her thoughts centering around the enigmatic boy who consistently kept her on her toes. What is it about that boy that always keeps me on my toes? She mused. Negotiating with him is more nerve-wracking than dealing with the royal families. What's your take on him, Avier? Her bond, Avier, landed gently on her outstretched arm, his intelligent eyes considering his response. He is... different, Avier's words resonated, albeit oddly coming from his beak. Do not view Arthur Lewin as a child. Whether it is mental acuity or emotional maturity, there is much more to him than the eye can see. What makes you so certain? Cynthia leaned back in her seat, curiosity etched across her features. His bond... Avia replied confidently, a calm authority in his tone. That white fox's true form should be that of a dragon. Cynthia bolted upright from her seat, disbelief and amazement mingling in her expression. What? How is that possible? How do you know? We are of the same lineage, Avia explained, his focus momentarily shifting to grooming himself. I may be of a lesser species, but wyverns are still the descendants of dragons. Are you suggesting that his bond is more powerful than you? Cynthia's astonishment was palpable. No, Avier clarified, his manner matter-of-fact. That child has yet to mature. She couldn't have hatched more than a few years ago. However, I suspect that when she does develop, my strength will not even be comparable to hers. Cynthia found it difficult to fathom anyone possessing greater strength than Avier. Her bond had chosen her, intrigued by her presence when she had stumbled upon him deep within the beast glades. Avier was independent by nature, and she had always been cautious not to treat him as a mere pet. The revelation that Arthur's bond was, in fact, a dragon, stirred a multitude of thoughts within her. It left her contemplating the true nature of the boy, 
especially considering the apparent subservience of the majestic creature to him. Do not make him your enemy, Cynthia. Avier's words echoed in her mind. His departure after issuing this warning felt like a gentle breeze. If treated with trust and respect, he will become the greatest ally, but if betrayed, he may be the cause of this continent's demise. With Avier's cautionary message still lingering, Cynthia leaned forward in her seat. She rubbed her temples, attempting to ease the throbbing ache that had formed as she recollected the events of the past few hours. Not long after Arthur's confrontation with Professor Geist, a mere span of ten minutes had passed when the door to Cynthia Goodsky's office forcefully swung open and the professor strode in with evident fury. Director Goodsky, I demand that you remove the student Arthur Lewin from my class immediately. Cynthia, taken aback by the abrupt intrusion, sought to understand the situation. Professor Geist, you look quite shaken. What seems to be the matter? With desperation and anger evident on his broad face, Professor Geist exclaimed, The boy shows no respect for me. Please, disregard any rumors that may surface. I am being unjustly targeted. Amid the tense exchange, a pair of brisk knocks resonated from the door behind him. Cynthia's voice carried a more composed tone as she granted permission to enter. Please come in. Catholm, a figure of more delicate stature, entered with a respectful bow, her presence offering a brief respite from the intensity. I apologize for the intrusion, Director, she offered, before positioning herself beside the now visibly pale professor. Cynthia leaned forward, her gaze shifting between them as she inquired, What's troubling you, Catholm? This sorry excuse for a professor needs to be fired, she said expressionlessly. Professor Geist grabbed Catholm by the arm, pulling her close to him. How dare you? Sorry excuse? Me? You dare touch me with your filthy hand? Her expression hadn't changed, yet she somehow seemed to be looking down at Professor Geist. Professor, I recommend that you release her arm immediately. Regardless of the circumstances, such actions don't reflect well on your conduct. Cynthia's voice held a firm tone as she rose from her seat, her gaze fixed sternly upon the man. The use of force against a student was a reprehensible act. Conceding to Cynthia's admonition, Professor Geist promptly released Cathillon's arm. He paused, gathering his thoughts before responding. Ah, as I was saying, please do not lend credence to any rumors you may come across. I find myself entangled in a setup. This entire situation is a regrettable misunderstanding. Addressing the matter at hand, Cynthia maintained her poise. I haven't yet been exposed to any rumors. Would you be willing to share your perspective, Kethel? This scum picks on students to feel good about himself, even ignoring the fact that he utterly humiliated Faerith. If Arthur hadn't stepped in, I would have. Without finishing her last sentence, she glared at the professor. Cynthia had turned to Professor Geist, who was desperately shaking his head at this accusation. I'm telling you, it was a misunderstanding. I simply wanted to demonstrate in front of the class what level the disciplinary committee is at for the other students' information. If that were all it was, then there would have been no reason for you to storm into my office and insist that Arthur be removed from your class. Cynthia sighed internally as she tried to decide how to handle this dilemma. Cynthia shifted her gaze toward her secretary, who had discreetly peered in to assess the commotion. Trisha, kindly conduct interviews with the students from Professor Geist's class. Gather their accounts of this incident, she instructed. Trisha bowed in acknowledgement before swiftly departing, leaving Cynthia to refocus on the two individuals standing before her desk. Please allow the process to unfold with patience. Rest assured, I will strive for impartiality, Cynthia addressed them, her tone even and resolute. Just as she was about to conclude the conversation, Princess Kathleen interjected, I am confident in your commitment to fairness. However, do recognize that were it not for Art's intervention, you would not be dealing with an ethics inquiry, but rather a case of student injury, my injury to be exact. Good day, Director. With those words, the princess turned and exited the office, paying no heed to Professor Geist's stunned countenance. Upon reviewing the students' testimonies, it became apparent that Art had overwhelmingly outmatched Professor Geist. While the professor's demeanor had never particularly resonated with Cynthia, his proficiency had seemed sufficient for instructing a basic mana manipulation class. Despite his designation as a light yellow core augmenter and a competent one at that, he had suffered a resounding defeat at the hands of a mere 12-year-old. 
Frustration bubbled up within Cynthia, exacerbated by the realization that she had neglected to assess the boy's core level during his visit. A 12-year-old, bonded with a dragon, had vanquished a seasoned adventurer, relying solely on his less practiced wind and earth attributes, attributes he himself had acknowledged as his weakest. What remained beneath the surface of this seemingly extraordinary boy? Could she coax the truth from him if she inquired? The question swirled in her mind, compelling her to seek answers. Art, over here! Elijah's enthusiastic voice rang across the dining hall, and Art spotted him waving at him from a nearby table. He was sitting next to a girl. As Art approached, Elijah stood up. Charlotte, this is my best friend and roommate, Arthur Lewin. Art, this is Charlotte. They exchanged handshakes, and Charlotte offered, Hi, Art. I've heard a lot about you. She accompanied her greeting with a coquettish smile, twirling a strand of her hair. It's a pleasure. Art responded in a straightforward manner, then shifted attention to Elijah. How were your classes? They reached down to feed a piece of broccoli to Sylvie. Q! Sylvie protested with her distinct vocalization. Ah, oh, your little mana beast is so cute. Do you mind if I pet it? Charlotte leaned in quite close, almost encroaching on Art's personal space as she reached towards Sylvie. Art intervened before she could touch her, grasping Charlotte's wrist gently. Sorry, she doesn't like strangers touching her. Art maintained a firm gaze, and Charlotte's cheeks flushed with embarrassment. Oh, I'm sorry. She pulled back, shifting her attention back to the food. Seemingly ignorant of the unfolding situation, Elijah responded with his mouth full of food. Classes were great. I especially like my basic chain casting class and mana utilization class. Though, for mana utilization, I feel like the professor's going over the exact same thing Art told me to do. Charlotte's in my chain casting class. She's really good. Charlotte chuckled and feigned bashfulness, her face reddening slightly as she fidgeted in her seat. Please, you're making me blush. Elijah continued his chatter, undeterred. So how were your classes? I heard you already beat up a professor. What happened to keeping it cool, man? He accused in a playful tone, gesturing with his fork in Art's direction. Yeah, about that. Turns out I ended up becoming the professor for that class, Art responded calmly, nonchalantly consuming a piece of meat as Sylvie made her move to snatch it from his plate. Elijah's eyes widened in disbelief, causing him to sputter and inadvertently send a spray of chewed food our way. Art leaned back instinctively to avoid the splatter, while Charlotte let out a surprise scream as she bore the brunt of the unexpected shower of food particles. Elijah, that's gross, Art remarked, using a napkin to wipe his face, although he hadn't managed to catch all the stray food particles that had come his way. Sorry, sorry, what, you're going to be a professor? Elijah wiped his mouth before attempting to help Charlotte clean up, only to be gently rebuffed. Art nodded with a self-assured grin. Yeah. Turns out I ended up stepping in for the professor who was supposed to teach the class. So from now on, you may address me as Professor Lewin. Elijah's retort was quick and sardonic. Professor, my ass. But maybe I should skip my class sometime and sit in on yours. It'd be a real show. As the conversation continued, Art grew increasingly vexed by Charlotte's persistent attempts at flirting and Elijah's obliviousness to the whole situation. Oh, by the way... Charlotte and I were planning to head to Downtown Academy for some shopping. Want to come along? Elijah posed the question casually. One section of the Academy featured upscale restaurants, cafes, and shopping stalls where the affluent nobles could indulge themselves, a testament to the sprawling expanse of the campus. Charlotte seized the opportunity to chime in. Yes, Art, you should definitely join us, she said, leaning in once more in a flirtatious manner. Art reminded his friend, I've got three more classes lined up after lunch. I'll be attending the upper division courses. Elijah simply shrugged at the revelation. Oh, right, I forgot. No biggie. Looks like it'll be just you and me, Charlotte. Charlotte offered an awkward smile in response to Elijah's carefree demeanor and quickly added, Actually, I just realized I have some other plans for today. I'm so sorry, but we should definitely plan something for all three of us in the future. Gotta go now. Catch you later, Art. And just like that, she departed, leaving Elijah and Art alone at their table. I guess whatever she's got going on must be pretty important, Elijah mused with a tinge of disappointment. Oh, Elijah. Drawing closer, 
He turned to Art with a serious expression. So, what did you think of Charlotte? She's pretty cool, right? You think I stand a chance with her? Art chuckled and offered his assessment. I think you could aim higher, buddy. With a pat on Elijah's back, he made his opinion clear. After their meal, Elijah's plans having evaporated, he opted for a trip to the library. Having seen him off, Art directed his steps towards his first upper division class of the day. Team Fighting Mechanics 1. This classroom, or perhaps more accurately field, resided on the farthest reaches of the academy where the advanced courses were conducted. It unveiled itself as a sprawling, grassy expanse ensconced by towering walls adorned with intricate runes. Amidst the field, an assortment of obstacles seemed almost haphazardly strewn. Atop one of the walls perched a diminutive chamber ensconced in glass, an apparent vantage point for observers. Positioned at the base of the wall, adjacent to the viewing station, stood a small structure emblazoned with a conspicuous red glyph, the healer's office. Considering the nature of the training, the presence of a healer was a logical safeguard. Two figures clad in white robes loitered nearby, their expressions betraying sheer boredom. Upon his arrival, Art noticed that a number of students had beaten him to the location, including a few familiar faces engaged in conversation. Unexpectedly, Curtis Glader's voice rang out. Ah, I didn't expect to see you in an upper division class, Arthur, he exclaimed, waving in recognition. Lying nearby, Grotter, Curtis's bonded creature, appeared serene with closed eyes. Art extended a friendly handshake, replying, Yeah, I didn't think I'd end up in a class with you. Looking forward to working together. Another presence quickly made itself known as Claire Bladehart draped an arm over his shoulders and beamed. Good to see you again, Arthur. Let's make sure we don't bring shame to the disciplinary committee, all right? He chuckled in response, then turned back to Curtis, inquiring, Is this the entire class? I heard this was a popular course, but it seems there's only space for a limited number of students. Curtis scanned the area, responding, There should be a few more. Ah, there they are. Art followed his gaze and recognized one of the approaching figures, mustering a resigned smile. Amidst the conversations, a hushed murmur from one of the students caught Art's attention. Princess Tessia is as beautiful as always. He watched as Tessia approached with a cluster of fellow students, engaged in conversation with Clive Graves, the student council vice president. Tessia's gaze shifted toward him, seemingly ready to offer a greeting, until her eyes landed on Claire's arm around his neck. In a swift motion, her eyes narrowed, and she averted her gaze, clearly displeased. Unfazed by the unspoken tension, Claire maintained her grip on him, her smile unwavering as she called out, Good afternoon, Princess Tessia. Her arm remained in place even as Tessia passed by. With a curt response, Tessia replied, her expression determined. As she continued on her path, she covertly delivered a quick pinch to Art's side, prompting him to startle in surprise. Claire's observation filled the air. I wonder if she's in a bad mood today. Art's internal voice echoed, It's because of you! Claire finally withdrew her arm from his neck, and as he turned to the trailing end of Tessia's group, he felt a fiery anger begin to rise within him. His fists clenched tightly, the knuckles turning white. There stood Lucas Wykes, igniting a fierce blaze of emotions within Art. A surge of suppressed anger coursed through Art as he contemplated the unfortunate reality of sharing a class with Lucas. The irony that it had to be a team fighting class of all things, where teamwork and synchronization were paramount, bordered on the absurd. Meeting Lucas's gaze, Art detected a nonchalant disregard, an indifference that cast him aside like a mere insect on the ground. Amidst the student's disoriented glances in search of the source, a resounding voice echoed across the field, commanding their attention. While his peers turned their heads, Art's focus remained steadfast, directed upwards to the colossal hawk-like mana beast that dominated the sky. The majestic creature, spanning a remarkable four yards in length with wings that stretched well over eight yards, gradually descended. Perched upon its back was a powerful-looking woman, her physique well-defined, and a massive sword strapped to her back. The instructor introduced herself with an authoritative flair, her voice resonating. Welcome, my name is Professor Glory, and I will be your instructor. This flare hawk is Torch, my esteemed bond. 
Seeking to assess the instructor's mana core level, Art's concentration triggered a sudden and intense pain within his head. Almost as if in response, Professor Glory pivoted her gaze toward him. Undeterred, she bestowed a confident smile before gracefully disembarking from her avian steed. Her scrutiny encompassed the entire student assembly, occasionally focusing more intently on specific individuals. Gradually, her path led her closer to art. The potency of Professor Glory's defenses surrounding her monocore was not an uncommon phenomenon, particularly among mages of higher levels. Concealing one's elemental attribute, however, proved to be an intricate feat. The intrinsic nature of mana particles associated with a specific element tended to envelop mages, making it challenging to mask their affinity. Most mages opted not to mask their elemental attributes, which made Professor Glory's robust defenses and concealed element all the more remarkable. Art found himself unable to ascertain her core stage or elemental attribute. Although he had developed the knack for veiling his core stage, hiding his elemental affiliation necessitated the use of intricate seals. Whether or not Professor Glory employed a similar strategy remained unclear. Yet one certainty prevailed. She was aware of his scrutiny. Following her deliberate assessment of Lucas, she addressed the assembled students, her words resonating with authority. I must admit, You've set an impressive standard for your peers across other classes. Taking a more extensive period to inspect those on the disciplinary committee and student council, she offered intermittent nods of approval. Then, her attention shifted towards Art, a playful grin tugging at her lips, as if she harbored a readiness to tease him. Ah, my newest colleague, Arthur Lewin. A pleasure to make your acquaintance. Professor Glory greeted him with a playful aura, an undertone of mischief apparent in her expression. The confusion among the other students quickly gave rise to murmurs of disbelief and queries seeking clarification. An upperclassman, raising his hand in inquiry, voiced the collective uncertainty, prompting Professor Glory to respond. Addressing the growing speculation, she confirmed, Indeed, for those who might have missed it during this morning's commencement, Arthur here is a freshman member of the disciplinary committee. Quite the prodigious talent, if I may say so. And yes, he's also assumed the role of the newly appointed professor for the practical mana manipulation class, a course you all experienced during your earlier years. As her firm pat landed on Art's back, the reactions of astonishment from the students surged forth. What? Professor Glory, this can't be serious. If that young fellow is a professor, I must be the king. How has our esteemed academy stooped to such levels, enlisting a mere freshman as a professor? Unbelievable. How can they allow a first year to take on a professor's mantle, when even the cream of the upperclassmen seldom receive such an honor? Amidst the chorus of disapproval and incredulity, Art attempted to distance himself from the cacophony, stifling a sigh as he had anticipated this very turmoil upon the inevitable revelation, especially among the more senior students. Sylvie's fur bristled as she issued a growling admonition toward the group of students, asserting, Papa is stronger than all of you combined. By this point, Sylvie had become a familiar sight around the academy, having been spotted during her passage through the campus or even at the morning's inauguration event. Thus, the presence of the diminutive mana beast atop Art's head didn't ruffle many feathers. Suppressing a smile at the mental image of Sylvie in her formidable true form, capable of swallowing them whole, Art continued to listen to the ongoing discourse. Let's not rush into complaints without a bit more faith in the director's discernment, Professor Glory interjected, striving to bring some balance to the discussion. Arthur has, to some extent, validated himself through his victory over the previous instructor of this very class. A dissatisfied voice retorted, but, Professor Glory, the professors for the underclassmen aren't all that impressive. I'm willing to bet most upperclassmen could outperform them. The sentiment was swiftly seconded by others, igniting another round of complaints that began to bore Art, who felt a slight drowsiness set in, likely the aftereffect of the hearty lunch. To be frank, I'm rather eager to test the veracity of your strength, lad. One particularly eager student chimed in, the anticipation evident in his voice. However, Director Goodsky has been quite clear that such endeavors are off-limits. It appears that your classmates will have the pleasure of assessing your capabilities in my stead, Professor Glory concluded, 
hands planted on her hips as she exuded a mischievous grin. The blaze of sudden determination flickered in the eyes of several students, their expressions so transparent that the thoughts they harbored seemed almost legible. I'm going to make him pay. Who does this upstart think he is? Murder, 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 murder. It's infuriating. Why is he stealing all the limelight? He deserves retribution. Amid this brewing hostility, Art shifted his gaze toward Tess, who sported an expression of mild astonishment. A subtle curve appeared on her lips, but she hurriedly averted her eyes upon realizing he was observing her, her ears taking on a rosy hue. Sighing inwardly, he mused, it wouldn't be strange for you to strike up a conversation with me. In contrast, Clive's countenance twisted into a scowl of disdain, while Lucas's raised brow portrayed a renewed curiosity as though Art had transcended from an insect to a mammal in his consideration. Director Goodsky recommended I take it easy on my upper division classes as I acclimate to the school environment. It is, after all, my first day. Art tried to defuse the mounting tension, searching for an exit strategy. Engaging in combat with a band of adolescents wouldn't end favorably. Oh, come on now, where's the fun in that? To earn our proper respect, you've got to demonstrate your skill first, right class? Her voice boomed, and a chorus of agreement followed. Was this some kind of military drill? Why did I always find myself having to prove my worth in every situation that cropped up? What do you propose, Professor Glory? Art questioned with a weary exhale. There was no avoiding this and arguing with people who had no intention of listening to reason was a waste of time. Have no fear. I'm a woman of fairness and justice, she chimed sweetly. Fairness and justice, my ass. It was as if she could read his thoughts. She ensnared him in a strong arm, squeezing his neck with her sinewy muscles. We're kicking off this semester with a little game. Aren't I just the nicest? Her face seemed more thrilled than anyone else's about the idea. She went on, now then, what sort of game shall it be? A simulated team battle? A skirmish? Curtis eagerly raised his hand. How about we have the three disciplinary committee officers on the same team, Professor? It would be a great opportunity for us to improve our teamwork as well. Claire gave a nod of agreement beside him. Hmm, not a bad suggestion, she mused, stroking her chin thoughtfully. But Professor, Curtis and Claire have had more training than the rest of us. It wouldn't be fair to have them both on the same team as him. A tall, black-haired teenager pointed out. True enough. Ah, uh, I've got it. Let's make the DC team designate Art as their king, and the team will suffer an immediate loss if he's taken out of action. That should level the playing field. Now, on to the other team. She seemed to mutter to herself as she pondered potential candidates until a hand was raised. Professor, what if Princess Tessia and I were to be their opponents? Clive offered. What? Tess looked at Clive in surprise, but Professor Glory's enthusiastic reaction was quick to follow. Oh, things are taking a fascinating turn. However, having two against three would create an imbalance. Her eyes scanned the group of students. I believe Tessia and I can manage, considering the sudden death rule involving Arthur Lewin, Clive declared with a serious tone. I'll offer myself for the student council team, Lucas Wykes chimed in, leaning on his staff. Ah, Mr. Wykes, our other brilliant freshman, very well. This will serve as an opportunity to gauge your abilities as well. A hint of skepticism crossed her expression, suggesting she might have heard some rumors about him. A few groans of disappointment echoed from students who had hoped for a chance to challenge me and a spot on the same team as the student council president. Yet, it was evident that everyone was eagerly anticipating the upcoming match. The match will have a 30-minute time limit followed by a brief discussion and analysis of our observations. Get ready. With those words, a pile of what appeared to be training equipment materialized on the ground from Professor Glory's dimensional ring. Her tone becoming more somber, she continued. This is specialized gear crafted by artificers to measure inflicted damage. Once the damage surpasses the preset threshold, it will trigger an audible alarm. Those who choose to ignore this signal and persist in fighting or spellcasting will be promptly dismissed from my class and may face further repercussions related to their enrollment. Remember, this regulation applies to all upper division combat courses within this academy, so commit it to memory. Each of you possesses sufficient mastery to defend yourselves with mana, rendering protection feasible. I must emphasize, however, that this gear does not offer safeguarding 
It is possible to sustain injuries even while wearing it. Let's spare our healers any unnecessary work this afternoon. Clearing her throat, Professor Glory demanded, Is that understood? Yes. Excellent. Now, you six, suit up. Returning to her bond, Professor Glory concluded the announcement, and the remaining students made their way towards the observation platform. Curtis gave Art a reassuring pat on the back before retrieving his gear. Looks like we're in for an early practice session. Let's give it our all, Art. I recall you had your eye on a sword back then. Let's see your skills in action. We can't let down the DC name, can we? I promise some extra intense training for anyone falling short. Claire's mischievous grin was infectious. Clive and Lucas paid me no mind as they prepared their equipment. The gear comprised of a snug jacket and an array of straps that wound around the arms and legs. Struggling with the arm wraps, Art received some unexpected assistance as Tess silently approached and began fastening the straps around his right arm. Is it appropriate for Princess Tessia to be helping me like this? Art quipped with a playful grin as Tess assisted him. She shot him an irked look, pulling the straps taut and drawing his arm closer to her. Cut the act, Mr. Genius. You don't need to be so formal. They can't hear us from that far away anyway. A sharp tug on another strap accompanied her words. I can't stand having to pretend I don't know you. You realize they'll figure it out eventually. Why put so much effort into hiding it? Art shrugged. You mean, you're not bothered? Grandma Cynthia made it sound like you wanted to keep things low-key, so I thought... Tess's expression faltered as her words trailed off. Well, I haven't been very successful at that, have I? Art chuckled, leaving Tess even more puzzled. It's fine. There are just a few things I'm keen on keeping under wraps. As long as those remain secret, the rest isn't that crucial. Speaking of which, do you notice anything? Art puffed out his chest, inviting Tess to observe. I'm not sure what... Ah, I can't sense your what... Mm Swiftly, he covered her mouth, leaning in to whisper, Exactly that, and Sylvie's true nature too. I'm keeping most of my abilities hidden for now, so you have to play your part as well. Maybe it's wise to keep my visit to your kingdom a secret, but you don't need to avoid me, Tess. With a release, he stepped back. She blushed and gently pushed him away, muttering something under her breath with her head lowered. Are you two finished with your little moment? Professor Glory's voice from above caught them off guard, and Art hastened to finish adjusting his gear. Arthur, I suggest you leave your bond in a safer place if she's not capable of assisting you during the battle like Curtis's bond. She pointed toward the viewing platform. Q, Sylvie protested. I think it's best for you to sit this one out, Sylv, Art said, giving her a comforting pat on her head. All right, I understand. She hopped down from his head and scurried away from the field. As Tess completed securing her gear, Art remarked, Let's both give it our all. I'm curious to see how much progress you've made. With a confident grin, she replied, Then be prepared, and swiftly made her way to the other side of the field to join Clive and Lucas. Art headed over to Curtis and Claire. Claire was stretching, and Curtis was mounted atop his world lion, Grotter. Even with Grotter, we're still at a disadvantage because they have two conjurers, and Clive is a long-range augmenter. It's an instant loss for us if your gear activates, so that seriously limits our options. Claire leaned on her unsheathed sword while stretching her leg back. She's right. Claire and I don't really know anything about your fighting style, so we'll match your pace. Our priority will be protecting you while we get in range to do some damage, Curtis said, petting Grotter. Tess, Clive, and Lucas were only a few dozen yards away. It seemed like they were going to consider us target practice until we got in range. This would be an interesting challenge. A grin spread across Art's face as his adrenaline surged. He was eager to exchange blows with Lucas during the match, and he suspected both Lucas and Clive were harboring similar thoughts about him. Art drew out Dawn's ballad, ensuring its sheath remained stored in his dimension ring. Curtis and Claire poised themselves, weapons at the ready, preparing for the coming clash. That's a beautiful sword you have there, Arthur, Claire whistled as she gazed at Art's blade. With a fierce battle aura, she channeled wind and fire attribute mana into her body, radiating an intense energy. Curtis, perched atop his bond, looked impressively poised with his dual double-edged swords. You ready for this? he asked, his determination evident. A hint of concern crossed Claire's face as she glanced between Art and Curtis. 
Art responded with a subtle nod, and Claire redirected her focus towards their opponents. Facing the opposition, Art channeled wind and earth mana, infusing both his body and his sword. His hair and clothing danced in the gusts of wind generated by his power, and the ground beneath him seemed to respond to his command. Through the commanding voice of Professor Glory, the declaration echoed across the battlefield, Let the match commence! Upon the signal from Professor Glory, the trio launched into action. Curtis, astride Grotter, took the left flank, Art positioned in the middle, and Claire advanced on the right, slightly ahead of Art's position. As the charge began, Tess, Clive, and Lucas dispersed strategically. Tess executed a wide arc, preparing to engage Curtis head-on, while Clive darted to the right, aiming to intercept Claire before she reached him. Directly in Art's path, Lucas stood with a smug expression that seemed to declare his readiness, implying, I don't need to prepare for you. This haughty arrogance, reminiscent of their encounter at the dire tombs, triggered a surge of anger within Art. The memory of Lucas's betrayal, using them as bait for his escape, resurfaced. The same disdainful smirk adorned his face then, just as it did now. Art considered that Tess likely had the upper hand against Curtis. As for the clash between Claire and Clive, he could ponder that later. With a controlled focus, he melded wind and earth mana, intensifying his power through mana rotation. Though Lucas boasted a substantial mana pool and undeniable strength, Art refused to concede his own prowess. With the deliberate release of his killing intent, Art aimed to rattle Lucas from his pedestal of arrogance. Lucas detected the shift and initiated a hushed incantation while retreating to create distance between them. As Art closed in on Lucas, he felt the keen observation of Professor Glory from her vantage point high above. Determinedly, he tuned out external distractions. For him, the battle narrowed down to a duel between himself and Lucas. Focused intensity tightened his gaze, and each footfall he made gouged the ground beneath him as the wind surged around him. Lucas chuckled, simultaneously casting a spell as he retreated. Inferno's cage, he proclaimed. The spell was reminiscent of Ember Wisp, the technique Lucas and former Professor Geist had employed, albeit on a grander scale. Orbs dispersed and hung suspended, forming a fiery dome around them. A surge of realization hit Art. This spell was on another level entirely. With a confident grin, Lucas snapped his finger and commanded, Activate! The orbs ignited in response, expelling torrents of fire bullets. Had this been a spell akin to Ember Wisp, Art might have managed to close the distance amidst evading the fireballs. However, the situation had escalated to madness. Countless fire blasts homed in on his position, firing relentlessly from every direction. Had Art not honed his body and fighting skills during his time as an adventurer, dodging and blocking the constant barrage would have been impossible. Progressing toward his target was futile. He was ensnared in a desperate dance of evasion and defense. Inferno's Cage was a spell that deserved its creator to experience the agony of enduring it firsthand. The relentless onslaught of fireballs and torrents, coupled with the oppressive heat within the dome, pushed Art to his limits. Devoid of fire or water mana attributes, Art lacked a direct means to counteract the escalating heat. Both fortifying his body with fire attribute mana and using water attribute mana to cool himself down were non-options. Lucas continued to mock him, taunting, just keep scampering around like a little monkey. Do you truly believe a commoner like you stands any chance against someone of my caliber? I can hardly wait to crush your meager confidence, the pitiful remains of whatever self-assuredness you gained as a DC member and professor. Initially, I deemed this class an exercise in futility, but now I see my true purpose here, to obliterate you. His usually handsome visage twisted into an unattractive sneer. Sylvie's concerned voice reached Art's mind. Are you all right, Papa? She asked, sensing his growing frustration. Yeah, I'm fine, Sylv, don't worry about me. How's everyone else faring? He responded mentally. Mama is holding her own against Curtis, and Claire seems to have the upper hand against that stern-looking guy, Sylvie relayed. Good. Keep me posted if anything unusual occurs. Art refocused his attention on the ongoing battle. Dodging the onslaught of flame bullets and intermittent streams of fire, Art found himself unable to close the distance to Lucas. Despite his attempts to counter with wind blades and earth spikes, Lucas either deflected his spells with his own, or the orbs forming the dome annihilated them. Art couldn't help but wonder about the seemingly limitless extent of Lucas's mana pool. 
was there no boundary to how long he could sustain the spell. He paused, forcing himself to regain his composure. Impatience wouldn't serve him well. He needed to think strategically. How could he employ wind? Wind. It was the movement of air. And what constituted air? Oxygen and nitrogen. Could he manipulate those elements? If so, how? Frustration gnawed at art as he grappled with his incomplete understanding of his wind and earth attributes. This was as good a moment as any to explore their potential. Merely conjuring wind bullets or blades wouldn't suffice. Lucas had preemptively erected multiple layers of fire shields around himself. Art's thoughts raced as he assessed the situation. His initial use of wind hadn't been inventive enough. He recognized that even with mana rotation, he lacked the mana capacity to create a large enough tornado to counter the barrage of fire. And even if he could, he doubted he could outlast Lucas in such a battle. There had to be another solution he hadn't yet considered. Meanwhile, Lucas's taunts fueled Art's determination to figure out a way to gain the upper hand. Lucas's confident demeanor had to be undermined. Keep squirming. I'm sure a few fireballs will slip through even after your gear activates. Everyone knows I can't halt the orb's blast once they're unleashed. Lucas jeered, his defenses rendering Art's spells ineffective. Art's mind shifted gears, focusing on fire's requirements to sustain itself. Oxygen was crucial. If he could eliminate the oxygen in his immediate vicinity, perhaps he could stifle the fire's advance. But he quickly realized the potential consequences. Depriving himself of oxygen might impact his own ability to breathe. The balance between neutralizing the flames and safeguarding his own well-being was a delicate one. Professor Glory marveled, her scholarly demeanor masking the amazement she felt. Well now Lucas exceeds the rumors, she mused. Inferno's cage proved to be quite the formidable spell to master, yet he executed it effortlessly while in rapid retreat. Merely 13, and already wielding a domain spell? The evolution of this world is remarkable. Even half-elves like Lucas, practitioners of fire attribute magic, and even the likes of Princess Tessia, they all possess an extraordinary prowess. One can't help but speculate on the formidable might they shall possess upon graduation. However, Professor Glory pondered, her gaze narrowing in thought. Arthur Lewin defies comprehension. While Lucas Wykes's early awakening could be attributed to his elven heritage, thus explaining his adept spell control, and Princess Tessia Aerolith's elevated skill set could be rationalized given her pure elven lineage and royal bloodline, Arthur presents an enigma. In that moment when he traversed the field to confront Lucas, Professor Glory's tone grew more intense, a chill ran down her spine. Arthur's affinity, his innate connection with both wind and earth, was palpable. It wasn't the conventional command-based manipulation of elements that mages employ. No, he seemed to effortlessly meld with the mana that enveloped him, akin to an extension of his own limbs, a harmonious dance with the very essence of the world. Lucas appeared to take Arthur's challenge seriously, a wise choice that likely spared him from an immediate defeat. The activation of the Inferno's cage spell enveloped both Arthur and Lucas within a sprawling dome of flames. A discerning eye could gauge Lucas's weariness post-casting, though the spell's nature allowed for sustained application, limited only by his mana reserves, an aspect seemingly abundant in this encounter. Comprising diminutive fire orbs, the dome served as a lethal snare employed by conjurers to gain an upper hand against augmenters or nimble mana creatures. Within the confines of the dome, the minuscule orbs wielded the capacity to discharge fiery beams and projectiles in any direction, effectively engaging the augmenter and enabling the conjurer to unleash uninterrupted spellcasting. Shifting attention to Curtis Glader and Tessia Aerolith, Professor Glory's anticipation materialized. Curtis struggled as anticipated. Professor Glory's past observation of the elven princess training under their director allowed her to appreciate the artistry of Tessia's combat approach. Functioning as a conjurer, Tessia wielded a staff that doubled as a keen-edged blade, hewn from an extraordinary wood of exceptional lightweight durability surpassing most metals. Her tactical repertoire encompassed self-enhancing buffs coupled with fluid spellcasting synchronized seamlessly with her motions. Amidst conjured vines, she pirouetted with a velocity surpassing that of certain trained augmenters, her motions further facilitated by wind attribute mana. The fusion of spellcasting and close-quarters finesse effectively eradicated vulnerabilities from her style, 
presenting a contrast to Professor Glory's own combat methodology, consequently eliciting admiration for the elegance and aesthetics of Tessia's prowess. On the contrasting end, Claire Bladehart seized the upper hand in her encounter against the student vice president. Clive stood as a rare practitioner of long-range augmentation, his proficiency demonstrated through a compact bow that discharged arrows at an almost implausible velocity. While Clive inherently held an advantageous position against the majority of augmenters due to his long-range finesse, Claire emerged as a formidable contender. Her combat approach mirrored that of her uncle, the renowned Caspian, wielding a rapier and invoking a dual fusion of elements. Flames and gales responded to her command, materializing into spear-like entities. While yet to ascend to her uncle's pinnacle, Claire's unwavering dedication to refinement nurtured the conviction that she could surpass his legacy. Diverting attention once more to the zenith of intensity, the clash between Arthur and Lucas remained the focal point. Awe-inspiring was an understatement as the majority of students remained transfixed upon their engagement, enraptured by the unfurling spectacle of unparalleled abilities. Upon closer scrutiny, a quizzical arch of the eyebrow marked Professor Glory's expression as her focus honed in on the unfolding scene. Curious anomalies caught her attention. A contemplative hum marked her thoughts. That's unusual. In an oddly fascinating twist, the trajectory of fireballs now found their mark against Arthur. The tempo of impact hinted that his protective mana augmentation might soon trigger his gear into action. Yet, mere moments prior, Arthur's evasion had been a masterclass in effortlessness, a paradox that puzzled Professor Glory's analytical mind. Determined to grasp every nuance, she willed an influx of mana to her eyes, enhancing her visual acumen. While the fire engulfed dome obscured significant details, sufficient information gleaned through the fiery haze unveiled the ongoing confrontation. Inquisitive ponderings revolved around Arthur's subtle actions. Was he in the midst of a unique tactic? A command ushered from Professor Glory's lips, torch, descend, inciting her bonded companion to lower, his majestic wings adjusting to maintain equilibrium. Gradually encircling the expansive fire-engulfed expanse, a gradual clarity began to replace the infernal chaos. Within this maelstrom, a distinct pattern emerged. Out of every barrage of three or four fire projectiles aimed at Arthur, one would dissipate into nothingness just before reaching him. An irrepressible smile overtook Professor Glory's features, her realization birthing an admiring chuckle. In hushed wonderment, words escaped her. No, he's... Witnessing Arthur's audacious endeavor, the pieces fell into place. He was presently unraveling the intricate art of manipulating air currents amidst this conflagration. A palm instinctively met her lips as her smile widened, awestruck by his audacity. The thought resonated in her mind. That little monster. He has guts. I'll give him that. Air manipulation existed as an advanced offshoot of wind magic, a realm far more arduous to master. It was a discipline that beckoned only the most discerning and attuned mages, those with an innate ability to intimately connect with the elemental fabric, even in serene meditation. This intimate familiarity allowed them to directly influence the fundamental constituents of natural elements. The road to such mastery began with years of meditative refinement, a crucible that laid the foundation for tentative real-world experimentation, gradually weaving the newfound technique into the intricate fabric of spells. A quintessential exemplar lay within the blue fire method. Mastery over this arcane manifestation demanded years of tranquil contemplation, forging the ability to conjure azure flames with unwavering stability. The leap from stable to swift incantation, a crucial stride in its practical application, necessitated even lengthier perseverance, reserved for those who aspired to harness its incendiary power on the battlefield. Yet, within this ongoing skirmish, the conventional sequence had been upended. A fledgling mage dared to interlace a nascent technique amidst combat, skipping several intermediary stages, a risk-laden, audacious feat. Bubbling within Professor Glory was an effervescent thrill, hands betraying a slight tremor as her excitement radiated. The unfolding spectacle held the promise of observing an unparalleled mage's evolution, a prodigious talent capable of soaring to paramount heights within the school, perhaps even the continent. Yet, a reverberating tumult grasped her attention, drawing her gaze. The crescendo of battle unfurled between Princess Tessia and Prince Glader, the pinnacle imminent. 
Adorned in his uniform, Curtis Glader exhibited the scars of battle, a testament to his commendable resistance against Director Goodsky's illustrious protege. The bond shared between Curtis and his companion had undeniably prolonged his stand. You forced me to do this, Princess Aerolith. Please be careful. Phase one, King's Wrath, Prince Glader roared as his body glowed. Initiating the acquire phase of his beast will, Curtis embarked on a transformational endeavor. Rare were the instances when Curtis harnessed his beast's bestowed ability, a testament to his perspective that regarded it as a borrowed potency rather than a native force. This acknowledgement showcased his commendable mentality, a consciousness that some amongst the ranks of beast tamers shared. The intricacies of their approach diverged. While a fraction relied solely on their creature's unique endowments, thereby stunting their personal growth in the long haul, others sought to harmonize these abilities with their innate strengths. Recognizing the key to optimizing the potential latent in the beast will necessitate personal empowerment. In the wake of Curtis's initial beast will activation, a palpable metamorphosis unfolded. Distinct and varying alterations marked each individual, and Prince Glader's transformation loomed particularly pronounced. His fiery spiked hair and brows cascaded with newfound length, adopting a wild, disheveled allure. Strapped bands encircling his arms constricted as burgeoning sinews expanded beneath the fabric. His canines elongated, accentuating his visage as his mighty roar resounded. A low, appreciative whistle reverberated from Professor Glory's lips, her response an undisguised testament to the sight's perennial impact. Such a display never failed to captivate her. Attention veered toward Princess Tessia, her position atop a verdant carpet of vines. Alabaster pallor gripped her features, a departure from her customary countenance. Professor Glory speculated whether latent damage might have been sustained, eluding her initial notice amidst the unfolding tumult. Remaining situated at a considerable remove from the unfolding clash between Tessia and Curtis, Professor Glory maintained her orbit around the engagement involving Lucas and Arthur. Yet, through an infusion of mana into her eyes, the scope of her perception extended. This arcane augmentation afforded her the vision to discern minute details, revealing the subtle trails of perspiration coursing down the princess's countenance. Prince Glader's resonant proclamation reverberated, a declaration laden with potency. His commanding voice seemed to pulsate with an underlying force as he laid bare his ultimate assault, a manifestation of unadulterated might. The atmosphere was pregnant with anticipation as he framed his declaration, a potent prelude to his impending move. The invocation of World Howl saw mana materializing before Prince Glader's mouth, an evocation that summoned an elemental prowess harnessed within World Lions. This maneuver, a final recourse, bestowed the might to rend even the most formidable adversaries asunder. An amalgamation of compacted Earth attribute mana formed a concentrated beam, a destructive force capable of eviscerating any obstruction obstructing its path. With a mounting concern, Professor Glory directed her focus back to Tessia, observing the princess in her dire moment. Tessia's lips moved, enacting a muted incantation, a reaction veiled with palpable tension, and then the inexplicable transpired. God damn it! Art was frustrated as hell. He could only grimace and try harder as he struggled to manipulate the air molecules surrounding him. He'd had little success so far, but he felt like he was onto something here. Noticing this, Lucas clicked his tongue and started chanting spells again. Flame Guardians! Lucas shouted. Art allowed himself a small grin as he realized Lucas was reaching his limit. Then again, so was he. Or to be more precise, so was his combat equipment. He wasn't sure when this thing would start screaming its alarm, so he had to finish this fast. But as the flame soldiers gained on him, Sylvie's worried voice shouted in his head, Papa, something's wrong with Mama. I'm going to help her. Damn it. No. You can't do anything while you're in that form. Art shouted back in his head. He could sense Sylvie's desperation, making him all the more anxious. No! The shout came from above. It was Professor Glory. Art took a quick glance up and saw that she was racing at full speed over to Tess and Curtis. Papa, she's not going to make it in time, Sylvie sent back, sounding even more worried than before. Damn it. Art's knees almost gave out, and the colors of the world around him inverted as he activated the first phase of Sylvia's beast will. This ability to shift himself outside of the world's time and space had a limit, 
He couldn't affect anything outside of himself unless he brought it in here with him. He didn't have time for that. He dashed through a gap between the orbs of the dome created by Inferno's cage, passing the frozen professor on her mount. Some distance ahead he saw Tess. She had already fainted and was falling from the conjured vine she was standing on, clutching her abdomen. The massive breath attack Glader had released was almost upon her. Sylvie was right. Professor Glory wouldn't have made it in time. Art could only grit his teeth in dread as he imagined his precious friend dying. Art sped up, his vision growing blurry. He was almost at the limit of his energy. Fuck. Hold on, Arthur, you can do this. He made his final dash toward Curtis and Tess, and as he jumped off a crumbling vine, he wrapped his body around Tess. Using what little mana he had left, he created a barrier around them. This is going to hurt. He released his first phase. As the world reverted back to its original colors, he felt a tremendous searing pain in his back. Before he could even scream, his vision faded and the last thing he heard before passing out was the shrill sound of his gear activating.